After I use all of these chemicals and furnaces and processes to make an integrated circuit, I send it over to the wafer probe station. This is the first place where I know if the device works or not, and if it's good, it goes to the wire bonder, otherwise it's pretty much scrap. I've made plenty of working chips, but really haven't investigated their characteristics that thoroughly. Previously, all I've been able to do are IV or current voltage tests, which are as simple as you could possibly imagine. You apply a voltage to a MOSFET or a transistor or something, and you just monitor the current that's going through it. Today I'm going to show you capacitance voltage probing, or CV tracing, which is extremely powerful. It basically reveals all of the secrets of your device under test. Simply, it's a two-wire measurement. You put these two probes on uh, terminals of your device, and it can reveal all kinds of things, like the thicknesses of uh, different layers in your, in your transistor, the threshold voltage, the dopant concentration or profile. It can reveal how contaminated the device is, which is you know, a direct result of how pure your materials are or your clean room environment. And uh, it can also predict lifetime. So you can start to estimate when your device is going to fail. In my case, that's pretty rapidly. I've only shown it briefly, but this is my probe station. Uh, it was donated to me, it's an amazing piece of equipment, but honestly they're really overpriced and if it wasn't donated I wouldn't have bought one. But I have it so we're going to use it and it's great. It's got a microscope so we can look through that and place these probes on a wafer and uh, characterize it. So in order to use this equipment, the best device, like the textbook example of a device, is the MOS cap the metal oxide semiconductor capacitor. So we're gonna fabricate a bunch of those today, uh, an array, I'll show you how to do it. And then we'll put them on the probe station, press all these buttons, turn the knobs, and then we'll have some graphs appear on the screen. This device on the bottom here is an HP4145 semiconductor parameter analyzer. It's a glorified curve tracer, which I have an analog one over here. So this device is an IV tester. This thing on top of it, I just bought on eBay for about 40 bucks. It was totally broken. I mean, basically nothing worked. The power cord was cut, which I don't understand why people would do that. The most worrying thing to me, worrying thing, um, was that all the screws were loose, which meant someone had been in there previously, but I outwitted them and fixed it, so it's mine to keep pretty much. I made some modifications, so there's some BNC jacks on the back that didn't used to be there. They're plugged into the bottom unit, so this is actually controlling it. This CV plotter was uh, meant to hook up to like a pen and paper plotter, and uh, you know, that's kind of archaic. I didn't want to do that, so I'm able to digitize it on here and send it over to a computer uh, over USB. So this box is basically a really precise uh, capacitance meter with about a femtofarad sensitivity, and we can go down to half a picofarad full scale. And then all this other stuff here just allows you to measure the capacitance on some adjustable bias voltage. The box on the bottom is actually setting that bias voltage, sweeping it from a negative voltage to a positive voltage, and then we're measuring the capacitance you know, on picofarads on the y-axis here. This is a curve of a, a typical um, metal oxide semiconductor capacitor. Okay, so we're going to fabricate a couple arrays of 100 nanometer thick um, capacitors. We'll probe them on the machine, and then after that we'll hook up some of the chips I've actually made, and then we'll probe those. Making a capacitor is really easy. You can think back to high school physics where they describe it as two parallel plates. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to use a bare silicon wafer as the bottom plate and then uh, a metal layer as the other plate. In between, we're going to grow a, an oxide layer about 10 nanometers thick and then we're going to put it in the sputter chamber and put gold on top. Uh, you could use aluminum or doped polysilicon or whatever for the top contact. The interesting thing here is I'm going to make the same capacitors on two types of wafers. First a prime grade and second a test grade which is much cheaper and we'll see the differences. I should have cleaned them and blown them off with air to get rid of particles but in any case we're going to go right into the high temperature furnace. It's warmed up to over a thousand degrees C. We can use an online calculator to figure out that we cooked the chips for about five minutes at this temperature to get a 10 nanometer film. And loading them is really simple. We just put them in one end and then I'm going to use a quartz rod to kind of push them to the middle of the furnace. After the five minutes is up, we grab them out the other side with tweezers and then uh, we're going to go put metal on it in a second. So in one step, we already have the first, you know, two out of the three parts done. So we'll do a quick test to make sure that uh, they're insulating. The first wafer there is bare and you know it's conductive and then these two we just grew that oxide on so they better be insulating and they are. All we need now is the top metal plate of our two plate capacitor 
So we're at the sputter chamber. On the left is the sputter gun. On the right is where the gas flows in. In this case, it's argon. It comes through the solenoid valve. And in the middle, uh, you know, underneath the chamber, is a high voltage power supply that runs the whole show. The chamber is stored under vacuum to keep it clean. So after I vent it to atmosphere, I pull off this one flange, and then we can load our sample in to be coated. The gold disc is the target. The metal comes off of there and will go onto our substrate in just a minute. I tape the samples and a quartz crystal to this chunk of aluminum. The quartz lets us get the film thickness in real time. I use this piece of perfboard as a mask to only coat little dots of metal onto the sample, and that gives us little isolated capacitors. All right, I promise this video is about CV measurement and not vacuum chambers, so we'll get back to it in a minute. I pump down the chamber, and then I'll do a quick coating in argon of about 50 nanometers of uh, gold for our top plate. After about a minute, we're approaching 50 nanometers of coating thickness, which is about what I wanted. When it hits that, I'll just press stop on the power supply and then take the sample out and we're ready to do some testing. Okay, the samples look great. We can see you know, an array of dots on each of those. Those are made of gold and those will be our top contact. I could have also put gold on the entire thing and then used photolithography to pattern dots, but figured this was easier for a quick video. I'm also going to use some conductive silver epoxy to make some more dots because theoretically having the top electrode made of gold versus silver versus another material you know, changes the work functions and uh, is something else that I can look at on the CV tracer to check my understanding. So seven minutes in and we're finally ready to take some measurements. I use one probe to contact the gold as our top plate. Now I could use the conductive wafer chuck, you know, the thing that's underneath the wafer, as the second uh, bottom plate, but I use a, an adjacent probe to contact the silicon next to the dot, and I have to kind of scratch through that oxide layer to make contact to the bottom plate. But in any case, we're ready to take some measurements. So I set up the CV plotter, and then I have to program a few things into the semiconductor parameter analyzer to tell it, you know, what sweeps I want to do, and uh, the, the, the current limiting, things like that. It's pretty straightforward though. Then after I press go, this beautiful curve appears on the screen. But what does it mean and what does it tell us about this capacitor? So this is where I get to gloss over a lot of semiconductor physics and really just give you a quick explanation of how this stuff works. I'll link to some PDFs in the description that really explain it to you, but here are just the basics. So when you connect a MOS capacitor and do a capacitance voltage sweep on it, you'll get one of two curves depending on how the instrument is measuring it. First is the quasi-static or the low frequency curve, which is this, it goes back up. And then the high frequency curve starts high and goes down and stays there. My specific CV tracer applies a one megahertz sine wave to the device under test and uses that to measure the impedance. So we're in this high frequency regime. When you connect a MOS transistor, regardless of the frequency, they always show the, the low frequency curve. So we'll see the capacitance start high, come down, and go back up. That's only for a transistor because they have PN junctions inside of them that alter the characteristics. And for kind of a complicated reason that's explained in the PDFs I'll link to, um, you're never able to get this high frequency curve out of a transistor. I'm not going to explain all of the subtleties of this, but simply the closer that the curve we see um, Experimentally, the closer that curve looks to the curve on Google Images, basically the better the device, the closer it is to ideal. Looking at it, we can determine a lot of parameters like the threshold voltage and something called the flat band voltage, which basically tells us if this curve is shifted to the left or to the right, which mine are, that's a direct result of contamination and ions that are trapped inside of the insulator. And it basically just means that the starting materials are impure or that um, the oxide layer I grew is really bad. So these devices that I make are not clean room quality pretty much. At uh, negative gate bias, effectively there's one capacitor and that's just the oxide capacitance. But as we start to sweep the gate voltage, there, there's an inversion layer that forms underneath the oxide. And this is just a bunch of electrons from the substrate that get sucked up near the surface and they get concentrated in this region. It doesn't happen abruptly though all at once. It kind of happens slowly as you sweep the gate voltage and then as you approach some threshold voltage, this inversion happens. And it turns from a p-type substrate to n-type because of the electrons. At this point, you have two capacitors in series. And as the depletion layer changes in size or width or depth, the value of this capacitor changes. 
Cox is pretty much fixed, but we add a series capacitor which decreases the total capacitance. That's why that curve went down and stayed down when we started sweeping the, the you know sweeping the gate voltage positive, and that explains um, the the third region there. Okay, back to the real world. So remember we made two arrays of caps, first on prime silicon, which is plot on the left, and the second on test grade, which is just cheaper silicon, and it's on the right. And as expected, the prime silicon is looking a lot better than the other one. Some of these graphs look flipped around the vertical axis, like left-right flipped, um, compared to the ones online. That just doesn't really matter. It just you know depends which way you connect up the wires to your instruments, or if the substrate is n-type versus p-type, it'll flip that but we can still understand it no matter how it's oriented. Before we move on to transistors and we finish up with the capacitor measurement, I should note that I made this look really easy, but when you make thin oxides like this, especially in a dirty environment, it's really easy for them to, for the capacitors to end up shorted because when the oxides are on the level of 100 atoms thick, then a single dust particle is tall enough to break through that entire layer and short out your two metal plates. So I made probably about 20 uh, capacitors across these wafers and then only a couple of them ended up working. So that's why I've made so many of them. Okay, on to MOSFETs now, we're done with caps. So these exhibit that low frequency curve no matter what you do to them. This is a commercial uh, MOSFET that has almost an ideal curve. Although on the right it has a bit of a stair step, which is strange. I couldn't find this many places online, but all of my commercial MOSFETs did that. I think it has something to do with the ESD protection diode that's inside of these because of the FETs that I fabricated, which I'll test in a second, uh, didn't show this weird stair step. So I think it's just something else that's inside of the package. Okay, I hook up a homemade chip. The trace that's on the screen was done in darkness, and now I'm going to add a new trace to it with the lights on so you can see that you know it makes some amount of difference, but uh, not orders of magnitude. So. These are some of the plots I've taken uh, from various runs of chips. You can see all of them are non-ideal, and the, even the best of them is shifted from the origin uh, at least 5 volts or so, which is a large flat band voltage, and it shows that the devices have very impure oxide layers. Okay, now we've got all of our data, so I don't have any fancy automated equipment. That means we have to do all of the hand analysis with just a calculator and you know taking measurements off the screen. I'll attach this great resource uh, in the description, which explains all the theory I just talked about, and then some of the basic hand calcs you can do. It has you know a spectrum that we just captured pretty much, and then they use that to calculate a bunch of uh, parameters, like the impurity concentration of the substrate that has units of uh, 1 over centimeter cubed is basically how many um, dopant atoms per unit uh, volume of the substrate. The flat band voltage, which is really huge in mine, uh, surface charge density, which is also bad in mine, threshold voltage, things like that. So uh, I did some of these calculations and some from a few other documents. You can find these things online. I could have done more analysis, but uh, after a few minutes in Wolfram Alpha, I get these numbers. So this is the thickness of the oxide layer. Uh, I was shooting for 15 nanometers when I made these devices about a year ago, made these chips. Uh, the math says they're 17 and a half. This is actually going to be more correct because the precision on, you know, I, I said I wanted 15 and that got converted to about four and a half minutes of baking it in an oven to grow that. So it's not very precise. So this number is likely more correct. Uh, then the substrate dopant um, concentration is about two and a half times 10 to the 16. That also makes sense, so we can look that up in a chart, and then that tells us the resistivity of the wafer, and it matches well with uh, what the manufacturer told me, so that value checks out. And then it says our threshold voltage is about negative 9 volts. It's negative because these are PMOS, P-channel devices, and uh, you know 9 volts is about what I was measuring with the IV characteristics. So all these numbers check out, and uh, that's great news. It means my new, v new CV measurement system is uh, working well. So that's all I have. I hope you enjoyed the quick intro to CV measurements and make sure to check out those documents I linked in the description to learn more. Let me know if you have any ideas for future videos or comments or suggestions. Thanks.